My name is Steve Rothstein, and I'm the Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. And on behalf of James Roth and all of my colleagues from the library and the foundation, we're thrilled that you're here that's watching and all the people that are watching online as well. Before I talk about this evening, just very briefly, I want to thank our sponsors for the Kennedy Library Forums, the Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I also want to welcome all of you that are watching in line, including those in the Cape at the Kennedy Museum in Hyannisport. After the presentation from this amazing panel, we're going to have a chance for question and answer from all of you in the audience and those online. So if you're interested in asking questions at that time, there are, microphone, there are two microphones and line up and, and Peter will uh, uh, take those as well. Tonight, we're, to, we're here to talk about Robert F. Kennedy, Ripples of Hope which is an amazing book. It's really a jewel, and I'll talk about this more in just a second. Um, and it really celebrates the 50th anniversary of the presidential campaign of Robert F. Kennedy and the impact that he's had. Um, after the forum, Kerry will be signing copies of the book, and if you don't have it yet, our bookstore has them for sale and be signing them uh, out there. We have four people on this dais today, and the reality is any one of them is more than enough for a remarkable panel. I mean, just saying the names that I'm about to read is like a legend of superheroes, of social activists for the last 50 years. So I'm going to give a little bit more background, but I, I apologize for that. And I'm really humbled to be on the stage, not just with any one of them, but all four of them together. So Marion Wright Edelman is the founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, organized the Poor People's Campaign with Martin Luther King. She's been the advocate for disadvantaged American for her entire professional life, the first black woman admitted to the Miss Mississippi Bar and directed the NAA Legal Defense and Education Fund office in Jackson. She's received over 100 honorary degrees. Just think about that for a second. And, and special awards and has written extensively. Now, you say, how do you top that? The answer is LaDonna Harris. LaDonna Harris is an enrolled citizen of the Comanche Nation, is a founder and president of Americans for Indian Opportunity, a national leader, and has influenced literally scores of agendas on civil rights and environment and world peace, founding member of Common Cause, the National Urban League, in 1980 ran as a vice presidential nominee, and again, has written so much. Um, that, uh, then our moderator is Peter Edelman. Peter is a professor of law and public policy and the faculty director at the Center of Poverty and Inequality at Georgetown University Law Center. He's also a former advisor to Senator Robert Kennedy, served in all three branches of government, and yes, is married to Marion, or they're married to each other, I should say is the author of many, many books, of, of four books and many articles. And last year, he spoke here about his book, Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. So all three of them is more than enough, but we're obviously honored to have Carrie Kennedy, who, who wrote this book. Carrie, I've known and had enormous respect for, for literally decades, and what I've seen her do at the, at the uh, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Center. And literally, both in this country and around the world has advocated for human rights. So a lot of times when it's not very popular, it's been a big advocate in advocacy and legislation and litigation and training. And in addition to this, has written other books that I encourage you to look at as well. When I said earlier this book is a jewel, it's really many, many jewels because it has many stories in them. And I'm just going to tell one quick one before I turn it over to Peter to moderate this that starts with Thurston Clark uh, uh, and he interviews the legendary Congressman John Lewis. And when John Lewis is said, when he faces a tough vote, what does he do? He thinks, what would Bobby do? So I encourage all of us, when we're facing tough issues, to think about what would Bobby do? And with, th with that, please join me to welcome our guest and I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Steve. I, I'm uh, so pleased and, and uh, just feel so privileged to have the chance to be here, uh, especially about this wonderful book, Carrie. Uh, so just, I know it's already been said, but it can be say, said 
twice what a fabulous what, uh, ripple uh, pope is, uh, and I can also say, buy it. Uh, so we're here to talk uh, about the book and, and also about your father and uh, about him. You know, this, there are four people up here who knew your father. That's getting to be harder and harder to come up with, except if you have three of your siblings with you. <laughs> so uh, th that's it, it's really lovely that we can all of us uh, talk uh, about him uh, having actually known him. And in fact, that's where I want to start. Um, our, our son uh, Ezra said to me recently that uh, uh, the documentaries about uh, your father uh, focus almost totally uh, on his public life. Uh, maybe necessarily uh, because that's what the film that's available. Uh, but Ezra said he'd like to know more about uh, what the man was like uh, personally. And I think many people uh, here and elsewhere agree with that observation. So uh, we have an opportunity uh, to talk about Robert Kennedy, uh, the private man. Uh, and so um, I, uh, of course, I'm the moderator, so I'll just say he was a wonderful boss, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'll leave it there. Um, but Carrie, I ask you, uh, as you know, a, a few days ago, uh, if I could ask you that question, because it's personal, uh, and you said yes, and after I read the beautiful preface uh, that you wrote for the book, uh, I definitely could see, uh, you, you definitely answered the question. So uh, please tell us what your father was like as a father. Sure, thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you all for coming here tonight. Thank you, Steve Rothstein, who um, worked very closely with me on my brother Joe's congressional campaign in uh, 1986, and we became very good friends ever since then. And uh, Peter and Marion and LaDonna, I'm so thrilled to be on the stage with all of you and my dear friend, um, Gail Everts, who is driving home with me to New York tonight, so thank you, Gail. Um, and uh, I also want to say that, uh, you know, Peter worked so closely with Daddy, so I hope this is a conversation in, in which you fully participate as well, and we can ask you questions too. But um, what was Daddy like as a father? He was. Um, he was enormously fun. He was um, just always fully engaged with us, which is kind of amazing because if you think of the role of a father in his position in the 1960s, that was not sort of the profile. But his, his father was fully engaged with, with him and his siblings, and he was fully engaged with us. And um, and he was he was always seeking to find ways to get us engaged in his work. So they, my parents really did not separate their home life from their work life. And uh, um, he uh, he was a wonderful, fun-filled father. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have I have uh, ten brothers and sisters, seven brothers. So that makes you appreciate human rights at a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there were there were lots of battles in our house, as you can imagine. And um, and I remember one of those when I was very young. Um, I was with my brother Michael, and we had a magnolia tree outside of our house at Hickory Hill, and it was just this beautiful old tree, and it had two tree houses in it, and we were playing World War II. And Michael was the, uh, my older brother, and he was a better shot, so he was the Americans, and I was the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so he was manning the upper tree house, and he had this, um, this waste basket full of magnolia pods, which look just like hand grenades, but feel like rocks when they hit your head. And um, so he was sitting on the top of the magnolia tree, and he was throwing these magnolia pods at me, and I was scrambling up the tree trying to take over the fort. Anyway, I was doomed, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I got one hit too many, so I scrambled out of the tree, and I ran up to my father's study, which we were not supposed to 
you know, burst into without knocking, and I burst in and I was crying, you know, tears coming down my face and my my bow askew, and um, I jumped into his arms and said, Michael hit me with a magnolia pot, and he said, well, um, you go get Michael and tell him to come here right away. Justice will be done. <laughs> and uh, went, got Michael, Daddy wants you. Okay, we come upstairs, and, uh, and Daddy says, now, Michael, don't say a word, and Carrie, you tell me everything that happened, and I told him in detail. Uh, this horrible injustice, and then he said, okay, now, Carrie, you don't interrupt, and Michael, you tell your side of the story. And I don't, I don't remember all the details, but it was irritating. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, so, um, you know, and then, uh, then we had to kiss and make up and go to our rooms and read for an hour. And, um, I, uh, and the, the, the message that he had for us was the message he had for a country, which is, um, you know, peace is not just something that you pray for, it's something you're responsible for. So you, you have to go make your own, you have to make your peace. You have to try and think of people you consider your enemies as your brothers and sisters. And you have to take responsibility for your own actions. And then you got to read. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the way he conducted himself in his most private, private life was the way he conducted himself on the political stage. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Ladada, uh, I don't know that everybody knows what they're going to know now. You lived, you and Fred uh, lived very close by, and you were in and out of uh, their house. It wasn't just senator to senator. Um, so you had a lot of connection. Yes. Um, so how did you see him? Oh, he had such a sense of humor. It was really, would, he would ping you with it, you know. He would get you some, in some way and, and make it funny as heck for all of us. But he had that crazy sense of humor. And uh, then we were always invited to, uh, um, to Highness Court. So we would see him there interacting with the children, he and Fred. I, I think I was the only person ever went to Highness Court that didn't have to play in some sort of athletic game. But <laughs> poor, <laughs> I, I swear that I am. Uh, poor Fred, he had to play. And so he played, they were playing with the children and, and, uh, he, and he, was, he was the pitcher, Bobby was the pitcher. And so he pitched and Fred said, you were, I said, you're pitching too hard. And he said, he has to learn, he did mm -hmm. say. But he was like, uh, sister said that uh, the, um, the amount of time with him uh, was so fascinating because he had this wild sense of humor. And then, of course, I would go to the, he and Fred were in the uh, not whole gang. They were the two, two of five senators that came to the Senate at the same time. And so they sit on the back seat of the Senate, and they, then they would uh, work on like welfare. Bobby and Fred were in, uh, helping to preserve welfare, and they uh, and they got in this big fight, and they had figured out how to uh, um, manipulate—not manipulate, but to work with within the Senate uh, rules. And uh, but they walked out of the room, and the person who was supposed to take that place didn't do it, and he became very angry. And his, you don't want him to be angry at you. Unfortunately, he never was with me. But then onto the um, um, Senate committees that I would follow them on and, and watch that. And he was so piercing with his questions, and he could get to the matter just right there, and also make it uh, make it feel that you had asked the question in some kind of way. It was. Uh, uh, he pulled you in to what he was doing. So I got to observe him both at home and in Highness Court and on the Capitol Hill. So mm. it was a wonderful time we mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, thank you. So, Marion, um, I know uh, firsthand uh, that <laughs> you uh, got to know him quite well uh, beyond the, the public kind of thing. So could you talk a little bit, uh, as opposed to the public person. Uh, who was he? What, what was he like as you saw it? Well, I, just in terms of the book, the thing that I love most is what you've been talking about with his parenting. 
um, and how engaged he was with his children and how he taught you about justice both in the way in which you related to each other when there was a dispute. He reminded me an awful lot of my dad um, and my mom. And, 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 and one of the central messages I think that we need to convey to adults today is that children don't do what we do, they do what we, don't do what we tell them to do, we do what they do. And the times that he spent with you all mediating disputes, making sure that there was a balance on both sides, and sentencing you, not sentencing you, sending you off to read. It um, was a sentence. It was a sentence. <laughs> well, I had, I had to read with my father every night. And one day I slipped the two confessions into a life magazine, <laughs> and he sort of looked over and said, what is that you're reading? <laughs> and I, by the time I had to read it aloud to him for three minutes, I never touched the true confession again. <laughs> but the engagement of parents, but that translated into when I got to know him, and watched him with children mm -hmm. in Mississippi. And one of the things that was very moving to me, the first time we went into one of the poorest homes with a little baby that's now famous with a bloated belly and a dark room, no television cameras, was touching, it was touchy. And he sat down or you know, stooped down to try to get some response from the child, and that moved me very deeply. Going outside, again, there were all these dirty children which have pictures in this book or in other books as well about him. And he had a way of just touching a cheek, you know, or, or rubbing a hand. And it was this nonverbal communication of compassion and caring that just moved me deeply. And in the course of the trip to the Mississippi Delta, we were going too fast in a, in a parade, in a, I keep calling it a parade, or whatever those things are that you go through with a, a series of cars, and um, with, a, with, a, with an escort from the police. And a little boy's dog ran out, a little white boy's dog ran out in the street and got killed. He stopped it, the, he stopped and got out and he went to try to comfort the, the child um, and to tell the police escort to slow down. Um, but just this, the way in which he related to children melted me in many ways. So all the, the views I had about the tough guy and all of my views about the past just he was such a human being in his ability to reach out to the poorest child um, and outside of the cameras. And so that was my big, big baptism um, into understanding this was a very important man. And the amount of time he spent with you all in terms of explaining and the thoughtfulness of the punishment <laughs> and the balance um, was really quite moving. So the parenting side of him um, was one that just struck me so much from your book. And I was very engaged with that part of it. Mm. Yes. Maybe one more story, and then we'll move on to the public side. Well, okay, but how about one from you? Well, uh, <laughs> the, thi the thing that I would say uh, on the private side, uh, because on the public side, you know, I went to a lot of places, Mississippi and Cesar Chavez, and things that I got to do, uh, which were just, for me personally, uh, an amazing experience, if I did some good, that for him and for the world, that was good. But, but just having uh, the, the way uh, that we did our, our work uh, together was, was very special for me. But he didn't have any lines uh, about the work uh, and the having fun. Uh, and so uh, I also got to one day, we were done with some, some uh, testimony about the New, New Haven Railroad. Uh, and he said, let's go see Jackie. Well, I put that on the private side, and it was pretty terrific. Uh, so there were things like that. We were, we were done with, uh, with, some, with Cesar Chavez, uh, and uh, we went to L.A. and had dinner with Barbara Streisand. So I count that, that like as a, <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> okay, is that great. good enough for the moment? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so great. So um, one of the... One of the um, stories that we tell in our family has to do with, with Marion and Peter, which was after <coughs> Daddy was on the Hunger Committee um, and went down to Mississippi and toured the Delta with, with Marion and with Peter. That's, that's where they met. Um, and he came back to our house. And you know, we had, as I say, all those kids and we had a dining room, which was always very loud. In fact, my entire childhood was really loud. 
I don't remember there ever being silence in my childhood, except for this one time. This one time. When Daddy came back from the Delta with Marion and Peter, and he walked into the den, we were like, you know, arguing about passing the jelly or the butter, or whatever. And, um, and he walked into the room, and he was just standing there, and there was silence. And we all looked up, and he said, I've just come from a part of the country where three people, three families live in a room the size of this dining room. And you've got to help those children. And it was, uh, it was very powerful. Mm -hmm. It was the only time, in fact, that I remember either of my parents um, making a demand on us to be involved in social justice. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, was, he was very, very, very affected by that trip. Mm. Profoundly affected. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, oh okay. anyway, go ahead. No. Well, just on, on, on that, and, and it would be finishing your uh, sentence, uh, he, the way he operated uh, in, in, in one major aspect was when, when he got involved with something new, uh, when, he, when he met Cesar Chavez uh, and, and when he saw the, the hungry children in Mississippi uh, or when he dug into welfare p policy uh, with Fred Harris. Uh, it was always, these were uh, for his uh, top level things, uh, he would add to nothing. Nothing ever got thrown out, uh, and so it was uh, wonderful for me. But I, the the pile would go up of the the things that I would do. So on hunger and and uh, Marion plays a role, a major role in this. Uh, but he he just uh, was absolutely, as you said, he was uh, beyond how committed he was to ending poverty in our country and had been working on it for a long period of time uh, in race and poverty together. Uh, uh, but the very next day he went down to the Secretary of Agriculture to demand that something be done and, and he got CBS News to do, do a documentary uh, and, and uh, we went to Kentucky after that and um, so that had we not lost him, it was clearly what we, what he was, it was absolutely at the top to end hunger uh, in, in the United States. And it came out of that day uh, that he just, it was something that, that was important. Uh, he, it was not, oh, somebody should do that. I have a responsibility, uh, he would say to himself. So that, that goes with the rest of what you said about what happened that evening. Did you want to say something on that? No, I was just going to say that he, he followed through. He just mm -hmm. never let go of that issue of hungry children. I mean, and he was like a pit bull um, uh, on this. And I was very frustrated because by, this was April when we went to Mississippi and then it became August. And Orville Freeman, um, the food was not getting out there. The Vietnam War, because you know, it was costing a lot of money, and the LBJ didn't want to alienate the powerful Mississippi people um, who were on appropriations or who controlled that money, and so no progress was made. And they were charging $2 for food stamps. We used to have food commodities, not very good quality, but they were free, and not particularly nutritious, but people were not going, you know, hugely hungry. But then with $2, there were all these people who had no income. And Ola Freeman said to Bobby Kennedy, you know, I mean, and you can see what he'd say to people like me, um, you know, there are no people in America with no income. And I remember the report was, you know, he was saying, I just saw them, you know, and they wouldn't believe Bobby Kennedy. What? And so it, it but, but they sent Peter back down, which is where we got to know each other a little better, and along with agricultural officials to go back and revisit the places. But between April and August, Nothing happened. I'd come back to Washington and I'm um, to see Peter and we went out to Hickory Hill and I complained about the food still hadn't gotten there. And I always stopped through Atlanta on my way back to Jackson to say hi to Dr. King and to complain or cry to hear him. And he was very depressed after the Riverside speech in the Vietnam War opposition and blacks and whites just savaged him. Um, and he said, tell Dr. King to bring the poor to Washington. So I give him equal credit in many ways. Um, for the Poor People's Campaign, and I was privileged to serve as a midwife. Um, but Dr. King was very down when I walked into his very modest office, 
And I said, I just come from talking with you know, Senator Kennedy, and he said, bring the court to Washington. And King's eyes just lit up, just lit up. And he said, that's it, okay? Um, and he went home and told Coretta and started planning. Now, I was the least popular person in the entire world with the SCLC staff, <laughs> because you don't have some outside kid who listen, your boss listens to that comes in and redirect Bevel wanted to do the Vietnam War, and that was a worthy cause. Um, Jesse wanted to do bread basket, but then they had to find the money in the budget to do to this do new thing, right? So, but, but, but it was um, the, the, the second great value here is that he was, he, he really never gave up. He just persevered. He was, you know, and he wanted to make it all happen, and that was also just extraordinarily um, important in terms of just hanging in because this is very hard stuff to break through. Mm -hmm. So I figure out he was the sweetest pit bull I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of those subjects, he and Fred worked on the uh, the uh, safety the, the, belts. The, oh, well, you're my, you got the mic. So, no, no, that's on the belt, safety you're, belts. You're all right. And oh. the automobile industry was just fighting them, and there were all kinds of es almost espionage kind of activity on that on their part. But they, he, uh, he, it, we're waiting for the. They were waiting for the committee to start, and they had not arrived yet. So he, he took a cigar and put it in his mouth, and Fred said, "Be careful! They'll take a picture, and then that'll ruin our, our position." So I mean, it was that kind of thing. He was, I, just to think of all of the good things that he helped on legislation, and one in particular that when he went to uh, South Dakota and uh, met with uh, the tribes in South Dakota and saw the children and, what, and listened to them. He was a great listener. When he, you got his attention, he would pay attention and listen to what you were saying and take it in. And you reminded me the fact that <clears throat> uh, when he came back to Washington, he introduced legislation to help support high education for Indian children, which needed to be done because they were moving they weren't moving into the modern situation. We had some really bad school systems that, that the Indian children had to go to. So he changed that. Just, I mean, he, came, he saw it and came back and passed legislation to make it uh, change. And I might uh, add, he had never had, uh, he was never chair of a commission, of a committee uh, or a subcommittee or, or because he didn't have enough <coughs> seniority. And he finally wanted to do something. And the thing that he wanted to do, and he went to Mike Mansfield, the, the majority leader, and asked him to have a special committee on the education of Indian children. That was what he wanted to do. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, we're reminded in the book, uh, Thurston Clark book, uh, that uh, in the campaign, uh, he insisted over and over again when he's supposed to be quote unquote, getting job, getting uh, votes for people, he goes to Indian reservations mm -hmm. uh, a number of times. Uh, and uh, the schedulers and the, you know, the political people, were like, no! <laughs> but he absolutely, he was absolutely passionate. And uh, that's not, although that was something he'd had a long uh, interest, uh, but it's the same category. When he got, when he bit into something, it was absolutely the yes. most important thing. Was Thurston Clark describes um, this as his moral imagination, and I think that's really one of the most extraordinary characteristics of my father. Um, it was that ability to see things from the other person's perspective, mm -hmm. and that's really what saved us from nuclear annihilation during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was his ability to imagine what Khrushchev was going through, even though Khrushchev was um, was giving speeches about wanting war. He understood that Khrushchev and Jack understood that Khrushchev had his own military industrial complex, which was pushing him to war, but that he didn't actually want war. And, um, and that, that capacity is what saved us. Another example of it was when he was campaigning on Pine Ridge and he went into this little home little shack where a 10-year-old boy called Christopher Pretty Boy was living. Christopher Pretty Boy had both just lost both of his parents in a car accident. Daddy went and talked to him and spent a long time with him. 
and then invited him to come and spend the summer in Hyannisport, the summer of 1968 in Hyannisport, and then spent the rest of the day where, while he was going around the reservation holding this little kid's hand. I mean, in the middle of a presidential campaign, to have that presence and to say, I care. And I think one other example of this is after Dr. Um, after Martin Luther King died, he went and spoke at, uh, famously spoke to this a crowd of about a thousand people in um, the biggest African American neighborhood in Indianapolis, and the people in the, the 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 front of the crowd had been there for hours waiting for him. The people in the back of the crowd had already heard about Martin Luther King, and many of them came. Um, equipped with uh, bicycle chains and, and, and chair table legs and um, Molotov cocktails, and they were ready to riot. And Daddy got up and said, for those of you who are angry, who are angered at this injustice, I can say that I know that feeling because I, I had a member of my own family killed. Imagine a politician standing in front of a group, a crowd who's ready to riot, and say, I understand your feelings of injustice and anger. Wow. It's just extraordinary. But in all three of those examples, it's that capacity to understand the person on the other side and to relate to that, that, that brought that avoided war, that brought peace, that brought justice, that healed the division for that moment in our society. And boy, that's what we need today. Yeah. And I guess we should just tell the story <laughs> of Dr. Mariah from Washington. Yes. And he wanted that's, to that's go. That's that. I don't know if they heard the beginning. After the riots in Washington, mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of burning down of things and, and anger, um, he, we, went for, we went to church at Walter Point Royce Church, and, but we walked up 14th Street. Um, and I remember, I will not name him, a, a black politician saying, what is that honky doing here? Um, but nevertheless... Why not tell him who it was? No, well... <laughs> <laughs> Ask me later. <laughs> But we, we, but we ended up, in, and I've been so moved this year, the pictures that are showing up in the yes. mail from anonymous sources of people. And two wonderful photos, more than that, showed up with us sitting in Walter Point Royce Church. I'd never seen him with glasses on. Um, but he, and he looks so young. Hmm. Um, I was just very struck by that. But he always kind of went where the, where the, where the, where the, you know, the hurt was. Um, and, and wanted to just simply be present. Um, and so I was deeply moved by that and how he disregarded our friendly politician. Um, but then he came back, he, but, 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 the, but just the fact of being there and, mm -hmm. and, and, and being able to calm things. And, and in many ways, it was out of that week the Children's Defense Fund got, funded because, got founded because I went to the schools to tell kids not to riot. Mm -hmm. And a little boy about 12 or 13, because I said it would ruin your future. And a little boy looked me straight in the eye and said, lady, what future? I ain't no. got no mm. future. Mm. I ain't got nothing mm. to lose. And mm. I've spent the last 50 years trying wow. to prove that boy's wow. truth wow. wrong. Wow. And I wow. thought we'd be out of business by now. But he gets me up in the morning still, mm. because mm -hmm. we have gotta, we've got to come to grips with this. And, um, and we've made a lot of progress. OK, the Poor People's Campaign was not a failure, I'll just tell you that. Um, because all those people on food stamps today and all those folk on a range of child and family nutrition programs and on WIC and everything else and all the things it unleashed in terms of the McGovern Committee that are still there, you know, we're in a very different place, um, even though hunger reasserts itself and joblessness reasserts itself. It created a health safety net. We had a follow-up campaign the next year with Ralph Abernathy, who was not Dr. King, and we had a very disastrous meeting with Mr. Nixon and his whole cabinet in the White House. Um, and every time Ralph would talk about hunger, he, the president would say, I'm bringing peace in Vietnam. But nobody wanted to hear about peace in Vietnam in a hunger meeting. Um, but, and he denied that it was anything other than a Mississippi problem. But within three months, 
because of the evidence that had been amassed. It, he did a major speech on hunger, President Nixon. Within a year, he did a White House conference on hunger. And by the end of that regime, there was a huge, huge change in federal investment in, in nutrition in this country. In fact, I often say that hunger really got you know, wiped out in many ways, but the, the McGovern Committee was monitoring. It, it unleashed them. It did not fail. And, but, you know, then Mr. Reagan came in and tried to destroy the whole safety net, not half as bad as Mr. Trump's trying to do, but he's not going to succeed because we're not going to let him do yeah. that. But I think that, uh, but, 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 so all those folks on food stamps and wicked, they ought to thank those poor people in the, in the mud in Resurrection City and Robert well, Sennadies and Dr. King's sacrifice yeah. to try to get it because we're in a very different place. Hunger's still there. We'll change it, but major changes. Um, came out of it over time. I, I'd like to uh, put one question to all of you uh, before we get uh, to the question of what do we do now, uh, thinking about Robert Kennedy, which uh, I think we all, and, uh, Carrie, you said that when we were talking before. But you know, uh, I'd like to hear from all three of you. We, we all know uh, that Robert Kennedy had uh, a, an absolutely re remarkable reach on people with very, very different backgrounds. Uh, I mean, there were people who didn't like him at all. Uh, and and uh, so it's not as though, uh, you know, we were about to have 90% whatever. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Well, that was, that was one person who didn't like him. That's, that's true. There you go. You're, you're really on I'm top listening. of it. Uh, but uh, why do you think, I mean, think of the funeral train. Uh, and uh, I guess, I think you wrote this, but five nuns uh, standing on tiptoe in a yellow pickup truck, uh, black militants holding up clenched fists, white policemen cradling a, a black child in his arms, um, and a line of a little leaguer, leaguers standing at attention along the baselines, heads bowed and caps held over hearts. And Sylvia Wright of Life Magazine wrote, what did he have that he could do this to people? What about it? Well, it reminds me of uh, the time that I invited him down to Oklahoma. I organized Oklahomans for Indian Opportunity and we were having terrible 75 percent dropout rates in schools so we were trying to focus on some kind of answer uh, to that issue we had interviewed children and trying to find out how they they had such low self-image of themselves and one of the things that we we created was uh, that if the young people the young indian people in their hometown and their own school would participate in other activities that they, we would invite them to the University of Oklahoma and have a great um, meeting there. And they would have to be exposed to the college and we would usually have a speaker. So I invited him if he would come to the speech. And then we started receiving phone calls when we had announced it to all the children in, in that was, were uh, trying to come to, to the university. They said that, uh, because it was Bobby Kennedy that uh, everybody wanted to come. So we told them that they got to pick out someone in their class to come with them so that they were the big people in, in their class. And so they chose a classmate and they brought, they had a busload of kids coming to uh, the university. And he spoke and he teased them and he just captured them in such a way that they were just roaring for him and cheering for him. And he got, then after he spoke, he went down and shook hands with every one of them. And, and so that he just, he elevated the prestige of those Indian children to go on and get a college. Now those children come and say, said, Ms. Harris said, remember me? He said, I'm, I was at, at OU at that meeting and I am now getting my PhD doing this or that. It was just a marvelous continuation of his, his uh, uh, contribution to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had, he just had an extraordinary capacity to connect to Carol after losing his brother, I mean the empathy um, and the accessibility and the curiosity. He was always asking yes. questions. 
and I used to tell him sometimes some of that was not his business. But he was really, uh, he was just totally curious. I mean, totally curious about everything. Yes. Um, and I, and again, and it, it, it's just this sense of wanting to know, you know, what you were feeling and, and, and how you got to do whatever you did. Um, and, um, and I just, it was, and he was a good listener. But, I, but it was the questioning. Always he had lots of questions, and um, some of which you should not have to answer. Um, <laughs> you know, what are you, who are you dating? What are, what are you well, doing? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. But, I, but again, there was some, but there was also a, a, a vulnerability about him. Yes. I mean, a vulnerability and, a, and an ability to connect with suffering, and I'm sure that's because of the personal losses. Um, but it was, I was not prepared to like him. Um, but I was deeply moved by him after he came because, uh, and, and, um, and so, and one of the most moving moments for me um, during the Poor People's Campaign was after the funeral train and the hearse was going to Arlington Cemetery and it was the most beautiful, clear night in Washington, D.C. The, 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 you, the, it stopped. Mm. And the poor who were on the verge of being left pushed out of Resurrection City back at the beginning of the next day. Um, we've been in all that mud, and I just recently saw the pictures of the destruction of the city in the final way. But it stopped in this moonlit night, and they all were singing the battle hymn. I could hardly get through it of the Republic. Mm -hmm. And it was the, it kept me going for another 50 years. Oh. Because we are gonna end poverty in this country beginning with our children this year. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the curiosity um, was passed on to the children. <laughs> uh, I was over, Ethel invited me over for lunch, and I was having lunch with her, and Carrie came up to me and said, Miss Harris said, do you live in a teepee? <laughs> 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 and I, I turned around to Ethel and said, Ethel, where is this child getting her education? <laughs> But it created a, then I just took her and set her in my lap and told her that, no, I didn't, but my great-grandfathers did and told her, made the connection for her. So she became uh, uh, admired of us. And so she, when my grandmother came to town, my Comanche grandmother still wore her traditional clothing, and uh, we had, a ladybird had had us at the White House and the members of the Senate the press was just curious because this little Indian woman with her braids and her shawl um, wanted to ask questions. And, and before that, we got to go to, uh, Ethel called and said, the children would love to have, see your grandmother. So we went over there and have, to, to have tea with them. So here we were with all the children and those dogs, those big old dogs that you all have seen <laughs> pictures of. Um, and here we were having tea and asking questions, and she sat my grandmother all the time and was asking her questions, and so she asked her if she would give her a Comanche name. So she did, and she gave her Comanche name, and she can say it to us today, and I just love the part that she, she still remembers it after yeah. all this time. Yeah, she's walking. Yeah. And, so, and your grandmother was um, Ricky. Tabby tight, mm -hmm. and I still have the certificate. I was so proud of it. Um, and Tisawaki means one who looks for the best in everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Such a lovely name. <laughs> <laughs> Such a lovely name. Yeah. When we were kids, and my, my dad would say to everybody, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my siblings would say, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a senator, I want to be a doctor, and I'd say, I want to be an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, <laughs> but anyway, so I had this great fascination, and um, LaDonna and Fred lived around the corner from us, as, as Peter said, so we'd go over to the house all the time. Yes. And yes. That's really, um, it's important and they'd thing, have dog so. fairs, so to see which who had the be most beautiful dog, and Laura took her dog over, and, and it had it made, what made it different, it had bitten into an electrical wire and has a little cut on its tongue, so that was her different dog she took to the fair. Most unusual most dog. Most unusual, yeah. that was her <laughs> <laughs> So um, um, Laura, uh, Laura Harris is here. 
right in the front row. So <laughs> thanks, Laura. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> so now my question. You all did fine with that. Yeah. That wasn't, with, you didn't with, answer my question. So, right? um, they, they liked it, right? You all so liked the, it. It was fine. So the question uh, never mind that was, you made me look bad. What was bad, the, but, what uh, were his <laughs> most important aspects? Is that what it was? What, well, no, what, 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 what was it? Why did he oh, reach everybody? Oh, so, why? Well, so this is what different. I think. I think that, um, I think that, I, I, I grew up in a political family. I was surrounded by politicians my whole life. The easiest way to win political office is to appeal to people's anger and hatred and fear. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we've seen now with Trump. But there's, but you know, when daddy ran, 1968, he said 20% of the American people are against everything all of the time. And um, you know, so now we're at 40%, but it's not that, it, it's not really that far off. And we've had a long strain of this in our country's history of uh, Huey Long in the 1930s and George Wallace in the 60s and Pat Buchanan, Louis Farrakhan, Donald Trump. So, I mean, and there's many, many more in between. What, when my father did, and that's, it, that's like a, an easy way to get elected, but it's an impossible way to govern. And that's why the White House is such a, a disaster today. And that's also, incidentally, why they can't really pass any legislation, even though they, they, uh, except, they have except tax. House and Senate. OK, some, right? <laughs> Which is a disaster for all of us and for everything everybody on this stage and everybody in this audience cares about. But they're not as effective as they should be, considering all the power they hold. My father was the opposite. So he constantly was challenging his audience and telling them things they definitely didn't want to hear. And you know, going into students, a, a group of medical students and saying, I don't think you should get deferments and all of you should go mm. fight in Vietnam. Oh my God, who wants in, to In Indiana, that? he yeah. said that. And yeah, and you know, he, he was always doing that. Um, but he had this, vision of our country, of all of us coming together, and uh, of everybody sacrificing, which he did throughout his life, for the ideals, for, the, for our country's greatest ideals. And what he did was he called for the best in everybody in the audience. So I've heard people throughout my life on Indian reservations, in the poorest pockets of Appalachia, and Bedford Stuyvesant in the halls of Congress, in the White House, you know, and all throughout the world of people saying, your father was my hero. And what is it that all, that he had in common with all of them? And what it was is he spoke to the best of them. He spoke to the best in each member of the audience, the part that says, we can be better if we're willing to sacrifice, and I am willing to sacrifice, I can be my best self. We can be our best selves as a country if we follow this man. And that's, I think, what made him different. Yeah. And you know, um, he said the same thing wherever he went. Uh, he wasn't, you know, uh, say this over there and, and so on. And in that campaign, uh, he had uh, things that he wanted to, everybody to hear about the war uh, in Vietnam and about the questions of race and, and poverty in our, in our country. And, and he would say things to people who clearly, uh, they weren't important, uh, at best, they weren't, in, in some cases, uh, dis disagreeing. But they could understand that this man was absolutely honest, that it was absolutely saying what he believed, and they respected that. I'll tell you one, uh, this is actually a story that I heard recently. Uh, somebody, uh, I, I've got this wonderful guy who sends me stuff. Uh, and uh, it was a, a speech that he gave in Eastern Oregon. Uh, and I listened to the whole thing a month or so ago, uh, and uh, they're, they're all white, um, and there's a bunch of them uh, in, in the uh, 
sort of the back of the gymnasium saying, Nixon's the one. Uh, so uh, two things about that. One is that the, that the speech is what I just said, uh, talking to these people, although in addition to talking about the war and the race and the poverty, he also talked, and th this is kind of Trumpite, except that Robert Kennedy believed it. He said, you feel like uh, people are very far from, from the national government, and we need to to make it so that you have a feeling of, of, of the ownership of our democracy, well, that cuts across. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that did reach people. And he lived that. There are examples. I won't go through it. But the other is uh, he sees the, the signs up there. And he says, uh, Nixon's the one. He says, the one what? <laughs> <laughs> so that works too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about the future. Uh, what would your dad say now? Resign. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that uh, daddy spent. Well, let me just go back to that what happened in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, because what happened in Indiana is, it, that was the first contest and it was impossible for him to win. It was, he was in a Midwestern state and he was from New York and he had a Boston accent. He, um, he was up against Eugene McCarthy with whom he would split the anti-war vote and then uh, he was against the favorite son governor of Indiana, whom President Johnson got to run in order to make it impossible for daddy to win. There were two newspapers in Indiana, and both of the publishers of both of those newspapers told their newsrooms, if you print one positive story about Robert Kennedy, you are fired that day one positive story. So there was nothing positive. No matter how large the crowds were, there was nothing positive in any Indiana press. And um, Indiana had about 10% uh, of, the, the, of the voting population was African American. And on primary day, he won 90% of the African American vote. The rest of it was white. And they had voted overwhelmingly for George Wallace four years earlier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so they, were, they did not like his work on civil rights. So that's what he was up against. He spent several months going around and talking to small business owners and farmers and listening, listening about their issues mm -hmm. and understanding what was going on and talking to them. Then Dr. King died and I talked a little bit about that speech. That night, um, 125 cities across our country started to burn. Indianapolis remained calm. And the people of that state, even though they disagreed with him, and even though they didn't like his, a lot of his policies, and even though they didn't trust him, and had, he had so much going against him, they realized this is a person who can hold us together as a country and who can heal our divisions. Even though I don't like him, I'm gonna vote for him anyway because this is really our only chance. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he won that primary, which was a complete surprise to everybody. I think what we, need in our country today is that ability to that moral imagination that allows one to talk to others who you don't agree with, talk to your enemy, see somebody like I went back to that story about Michael and I, see, see people who you consider your enemy, you got to see them as your brothers and you got to take responsibility for your part in it. And, um, and uh, so I think the, the main thrust of his campaign 
was about healing the divisions between black and white, young and old, rich and poor in our country. And there's never been a time since then that we were so divided. And he was the only politician who could bring everybody together. Mm. Oh. Thank you on that. Well, Marion, what, what, what does Robert Kennedy mean for you now? That you follow his example, that you fight the things he fought for, that you continue to try to make bridges between people who disagree, that you do not let the rich exploit the poor, um, that you make sure that there are no hungry children. And I don't begrudge anybody their first billion or second billion. If there are no hungry children, if every child has health care, if every child has what we as our parents, those of us who are middle class or upper class have for our children, God did not make two classes of children. And we have got to continue to do that at our peril. We've made progress, but here you're trying to really destroy um, everything over the last 50 years, and, and there's been a lot of progress, I just tell you that but we've got to keep moving forward and not leave it up to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to refight these battles again. So this is a movement time, and we're going to try to start by ending child poverty. We know how to do it. It's a bargain. You can't afford not to do it. It's the only thing a decent country and a just country would do. And I have no doubt if your daddy were here, uh, we'd be having a good time together, sort of putting together this campaign. So I think, let's remember him. There are more poor children in America, 13.2 million children who are poor, the poorest age group in America. That's more, that, that's, that's more than Massachusetts by far, three times by big. You know, it, it, it's ridiculous that our babies and our young children, and we don't have a high quality early childhood system, and we know how to end poverty and we'll save money as well as save lives and we'll save our nation's soul. So I just hope that we will honor Robert Kennedy with these forums, but with our votes, with our actions, with our organizing, and finish the job he was so passionate about achieving. So. <laughs> So, LaDonna, you're still a major force, and it's really the whole, your whole life uh, working in the Native American community as well as in, in our whole country. Um, what does that put Robert Kennedy into that picture of, of what you've done, what you're doing now, uh, how you see him now, particularly in relation to the things that, that are so central to what you do? The um The, the change in the Native American community is just remarkable. Um, as I said, we organized o Oklahomans for Indian Opportunity, and we went, oh, the state was divided in the Plains Indians, which the Comanches are a part of, uh, and the tribes that were forced into Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears, you remember those stories, they were on the eastern side of the state. So with our organization, we had organized the Indians on the west side of the state, and decided we should go over and do that. But culturally, they were very different than us, so it took some energy. And we went over, but we went over, and they um, and found out that they that the government was still uh, dictating their government. That each tribe has its own government, and and I said, "Wow, well, we've been doing this for 20 years. You know, we've been organizing ourselves. And why are you?" still doing this. And so they were so poor they didn't have, oh, they just, you could just mark, I think you can see um, Wilma Mankiller's story about the water. Mm -hmm. That was, that was so, uh, that was kind of the things that was wrong. They didn't have water. They didn't have just things that they, and then the, um, um, and Shriver helped us <laughs> because the, uh, the war and poverty money was going to the county that should be going to the tribes, and we were able to change that. Not needless to say, they, we were liked. We were called communists when we went over there, and <laughs> and uh, but the, I guess the most beautiful thing to tell you is that when they took over their own government and started taking care of themselves in a different way, had the confidence to govern themselves, is that they. Uh, they now are the, next to oil and gas, they're the largest contribution to Oklahoma tax system. Oh, and so they have just come, you know, 
found their cells, they found a method to improve themselves. They have their own hospitals now, their education level is up. It's just the most remarkable, and they have museums. I invite you all to come and see uh, the, uh, the work that they've done for themselves to represent themselves. And one of the, we have a leadership program in our organization, and one of the young women who went through it is uh, now a professor at OU, but before that she worked for her tribal chairman, and she was the one that set up the museum and got to do in printing press to tell their own story because their story had been lost so so poorly and um, so that's that's the kind of thing when you see success and you and you, it's it's amazing what you can do for another individual by just uh, showing some interest in them and paying attention and that they're they they're valuable in Comanche culture, we say everybody has medicine. And some people don't, medicine means you have your strengths. And some people don't know how to uh, cultivate their medicine. And, and Bobby Kennedy was one who knew how, and he knew how to uh, cultivate other people's medicine to make them strong. And that's, I think that's what I love about him the most is that he brought that that he valued it. Mm -hmm. most, <laughs> most people don't. And that was what he brought that everybody loved. I'm sorry that he got so emotional about it. Mm -hmm. But just thinking about what conditions that those tribes were in mm -hmm. before we started working. Mm -hmm. And Sarge Proverb was a real instrumental in that as well. But it was that interest in taking, not taking care of them, but to uh, show them how yeah. they can take care of themselves. And that was the great, greatest success story in Oklahoma, I think. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have to say take one last thing. We uh, need to retire the NRA as being in charge of safety <laughs> in this country. And now, we've got the power to do it. We've got to stop the killing of children. We just, and, and, and I told, I was at the Methodist Women last week, and they've got, oh, wow, they, 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 there's 8 million Methodists. There's alleged 5 million NRA members. I mean, we just need to organize and stop the killings and make nonviolence the rule in this country. And we can do that. Questions? Uh, Questions. A lot, of, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, it lights up. Where are the the, the uh, microphones? One here, one over there. Yes. Why first? <clears throat> My name is Ray Mack. I'm from Boston, and I come here all the time. But I lived for many years in Oklahoma. Nice. Oh, nice. And I'm so proud of this, I can't believe that I'm getting to see you. I lived in Norman and I lived in Dell City and I just want to come up there at the end of this whole thing and shake your hand. You Aww. and Fred. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. I love that. Enough said. Thank you. <laughs> I have to thank you so much. This was wonderful. And Dr. Edelman, I have a pit bull, and he's the greatest dog. I mean, he's the greatest. I didn't want him. I thought it was a mistake, and he has just been wonderful. Pit bulls are great, of human or animal. Um, Ms. Kennedy, I wondered, I've gone through your father's office here, and I've seen these wonderful Picasso-like painting or sketches from children. I believe they might have been from your family. And I Picasso wondered... Picasso like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the fact that he had those there and he was so proud of them. Because I work with children. I'm a, I'm a poet laureate from North Andover. Oh, and I work with poetry and illustrated poetry, which Beautiful. is artwork on the same page as the poem and they're put in every thing you, place you can think of, doctor's offices, uh, ba banks, um, car dealerships, doctor, you know, everywhere. So what I wondered, 
of your family, I think that you had a lot of people who loved poetry. Your Uncle Ted you t used to bring that idea out with almost every speech. Um, did you have people who liked to write it? Do you know of any of your relatives who? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So poetry is a big part of our growing up. I know. My, um, we had to memorize a poem uh, every Sunday night and recite it at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And um, we always had a, a book of um, the uh, best loved poems of the American people at next to the dinner table, which my father would often pick up and, and read aloud every time we went camping, which was a lot. <laughs> um, he, would, he would read um, poems to us out loud all the time. And, um, and then when he would go on trips, he would uh, leave a poem to all of us. And he would say, memorize this poem. Whoever memorizes it will get a prize when you come back. Oh so, my gosh. Um, yeah, so I remember, oh, and I'll tell you a funny story. Well, anyway, one of those, one of those poems was The Charge of the Light Brigade, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, about 600 men riding to, into an ambush and to be slaughtered, which is kind of an odd choice to get your seven-year-old daughter to memorize. <laughs> But there's a line in it that says, theirs is not to reason why, theirs is not to make reply, all in the valley of death rode the 600. And I think, you know, my father, um, it, was, it was during the Vietnam War era, and he wanted us to love literature, but he also wanted us to question authority. And he wanted us to appreciate how dangerous it is if you failed your question authority. But I'll tell you just one funny story, which is we used to play a game, which we played all the time when I was growing up, um, called the poetry game, in which you would, somebody would take up a, a poetry book and tell everybody the name of a poem. Okay. And then everybody at the table would write a poem with that name. And then you would gather them up, and the person would read them out loud and read the actual real one out loud. And you had to guess who wrote which one and oh who wrote gosh. the real one. So, you know, most of our poems were really stupid, beginning with <laughs> roses are red, violets are blue, you know, something like that. But anyway, well, we really loved doing it. But Robert Frost came to the inauguration and, you know, and then they had Robert Frost, like, in town for a couple of days, and what are you going to do with Robert Frost? So <laughs> my, mo my father said to my mother, would you, you know, have a, a lunch? And so, great. So Robert Frost comes over to Hickory Hill, oh. and my mother says, I've got a great game. <laughs> <laughs> the poetry oh, game, so anyway, there you go. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I'm on the Robert Frost board in Lawrence. Oh, good for I'm you. I'm a member of the board. Okay, yes. good for you. Well, we'll have to get you to play that game, too. <laughs> uh, well, you were here. Let's go, you and then over here, because they've been, yeah. Carrie, um, Carrie, you're certainly right about the Indianapolis speech uh, being another sign of your father's greatness, uh, the way he handled a potentially violent crowd. And he even quoted uh, Greek philosophers, uh, Aeschylus. Yes, he did. And it was my understanding I've read that he was actually, around that time, had done more studying on the Greek philosophers to find more peace within his own life. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure within your family, with your grandmother, Rose, or the Catholic faith was very important, probably to your father, too. Could you tell me about his methods of finding peace in a very tough society when he had to be a bulldog at times, too. Yeah, you know, I think um, after Jack died, he went into a very, very, very dark period of, of um, mourning. And um, my Aunt Jackie gave him the, the Greek way by Edith Hamilton. And it was really a transformative moment for him because he found in that articulation of, uh, of um, facing difficulty of courage, of uh, poetry, um, a way forward for himself, and, a, and an extraordinary amount of inspiration. 
And of course, he, in that spontaneous speech to that crowd in Indianapolis, um, he was able to recite uh, Aeschylus um, back to them, yeah. And, you know, his sort of, there's, it's interesting because one of his closest aides said, you could wrap up Robert Kennedy's life in the phrase, get your boot off his neck. And that's actually very true about how he spent most of his life. But in that speech, he says, um, uh, we should, he, he, he t talks about the Greeks and he says, we should strive to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. So he really spent a lot of his time taming the savageness and going after the Jimmy Hoffas and the, and the, the bad guys, but he also really strove to make gentle the life of the world, and that's the story of, of Christopher Pretty Boy, and that's the story of walking into those shacks in Mississippi and rubbing the back of his hand across people's face. So he, he, he combined both. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Cabadas. I'm a uh, veteran for peace. And I was profited uh, through the war on poverty. I grew up in South Boston, and there was many programs that brought me into uh, the university over at Tufts, and the government was giving all sorts of programs for the poor, which was very important. When uh, Robert Kennedy was running for president, I was very enlightened because the war in Vietnam was going on at the time and I was in, at college. And then what happened was he gets assassinated. I win a lottery. I wind up in the army. I go to Vietnam. People were on the street. They were protesting the war. And I'm alive today because my tour of duty was shortened by the uh, protests in the 60s wow. in the early 70s. So Beautiful. I have to thank everybody who protested the war in yeah, uh, that's Vietnam. Really great. Thank you very much. Now I think, uh, I think of the future of uh, today. I'm part of that um, campaign, uh, for the poor, uh, poor cam campaign that's going on in Boston today. I'm participating in those activities. And the one thing I think Robert Kennedy would be very, very disappointed in today, the peace movement. I've been out for 17, 16 years giving up fires around the Boston area with very, very, very few people. We started off with uh, 20 back in the two, uh, 2002. We're down to very few people. And I cannot understand why 17 years of a war that was the same war I fought in in Vietnam, and we're going to wind up spending billions and trillions of dollars for a, a military ex expansion that is destroying the country. And there's nobody out in the street today protesting it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody want to comment or? I think thank you is what we would say, and thank you very, very much. Um, well, Ms. Kennedy, thank you for sharing your father with us tonight. I really appreciate that. But I also have to really say something to Marion Elderman. My wife and I are here. She's the one in the wheelchair over there. And we have followed your career through our lives and have been participating in some of the incredible activism that you have and just want to say what an honor it is to be in the same room with such a lifelong activist. Um, I just wanted to see. My question more is a, a thought. I've been starting to read the book um, uh, that just recently came out about your father with Martin Luther King. But one of the things that I've kind of thought about was um, especially in re regard to his whole public persona. He was really seen as a tough guy. You know, the guy who went after Jimmy Hoffa, sometimes being ruthless, sometimes really being hard-edged. And I think s some of us always end up sort of playing the same character through our whole life. But what it felt like, and your story that you said earlier, Marion, about him being in, in Mississippi and walking into the houses, and his talk during the Vietnam War, and uh, my question would be, it feels like there was a transformation of a man there, where he moved from someone who was protecting his brother when he was the attorney general and making sure that his brother's interests were really at, at stake when he was president, um, to somebody who really became 
so much more of a gentle soul. And I, I just saw, saw that sort of as a complete transformation. I was wondering um, for any of you what your thoughts are about that. Um, well, I, yeah, I've heard about that my whole life. I, I, you know, I think there's something to it, but not as much as people make of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that after Uncle Jack died, he, Daddy went through, uh, as I said, this very long, extensive mourning period in which he was, he was going to take his time with it. And he, he was willing to walk through that dark path and to learn the lessons that it had to teach him. And it was a very reflective period. And he learned a lot from, from the poets. So there's no question about that. But this image of him, there's a myth that he was like this tough guy, and then suddenly he wasn't. And that's, that's, that did not happen. When he was, um, as a child, he was known to stop bullies. As a college student, he um, stood up to this kind of radio, Father Feeney, who is this kind of rabid, uh, anti-Semitic, far-right Catholic radio priest. Um, and at a time when it's hard to stand up to a priest, he also refused on his foot on the Harvard football team to go to uh, away games unless everybody on the football team could stay in the same hotel because it was an African American member of that team. I mean, this is in the, no, when would that be? That was 25, 35, 40. So this 40s, is in the yeah. early 40s. You know, um, he invited, as a law student, he invited Ralph Bunch, who was the first African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize, to speak at the University of, of Virginia Law School. And they had a law, so they had a, 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 a policy that African Americans couldn't speak in a mixed audience. And so Daddy got that rule changed. There was no hotel that Ralph Bunch could stay in within, you know, 40, 50 miles. And so he stayed in the, the room, in the house with my parents. And they had Molotov cocktails thrown at them and racial epithets yelled at them all night long. So, I, I mean, I can go on and on and on like this, but it's not like the guy woke up one morning and said, oh, I care about people, you know? He, he, <laughs> this was his whole life, but it wasn't his whole public life. So well, I think that... Uh, let me just add yeah. uh, very quickly, because you, uh, Carrie. Uh, number one, uh, this is a guy who is tough and he's tender. And uh, you don't get to be the person who gets his brother to be president if you're not tough. Uh, tough's an okay word. Uh, and, and so the, the thing that, that is, got used in terms of the, the English language is ruthless. That's different. And that's not appropriate in relation to Robert Kennedy, even though we heard it. Secondly, uh, d just on the question, and, and again, there's no question. We, we've all said it. Of course, you lived it. Uh, the, 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 the consequence of losing his brother, it, 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 it just... Uh, uh, you can't even find words for it. But he works on poverty, uh, just on the policy side, uh, on the day that he gets to be attorney general, not the day he gets to be senator. He puts his friend Dave Hackett to work uh, in the next door uh, office in the Justice Department and tells him to work on juvenile delinquency, which is about opportunity for young people. Uh, and in April of that year, he goes uh, up to Harlem, and uh, this is in the middle of the Bay of Pigs, uh, and he goes up to uh, Harlem with Dave Hackett and meets with a, a group of black young men and uh, Italian uh, who lived uh, there. And it, the, the planning for what became the War on Poverty took place in his office. So just to add that, uh, to, to give the, the three-dimensionality. So... Thank uh, you here. very much. Uh, we, got, uh, we, we got all, I think we're going to make it. Uh, huh. uh, perfect. This you're wonderful. This is, you're, everybody's timing is so good. Yeah. 
This then, question actually comes from someone watching online. I'm oh. just reading it for them. Oh, okay. Uh, their question is regarding issues in the lower Mississippi Delta, the work that's mm -hmm. being done now, if you have thoughts um, and maybe, you know, how those issues of poverty now and then, have they changed or not? Um, she's just looking for any general opinions on mm -hmm. that. I keep a Mississippi office <laughs> and I get reports every week. And some things are, are good and some things are horrible. Um, we have the largest number of black elected officials in the country, but they forgot that they have to serve a broader constituency beyond themselves. And so they negotiated redistricting, but to protect their own offices rather than to be there that they can have maximum impact. The schools are in, many of them are in receivership. Um, it's, it's an absolute disgrace. We run some freedom schools. We are working on early childhood. We've now got a former CDF employees to chair of the school board in Jackson, but it and 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 but poverty is still there. The state of Mississippi, we've made great progress in getting new laws to feed children in the summer. We have a hundred percent federally funded school breakfast and school lunch program, um, and there's after-school money. The district is like the Medicaid; they won't take Medicaid, right? You know, they won't take money to serve hungry children. I mean, and, and, and again, why are we not up in arms? And so it's, the, you know, we, we've made significant progress in some ways, but those who have gotten into power, you know, have forgotten those who need the power to exist. And so we've got to have a movement, and we've got to really use our votes, and we've got to organize and put people out of office, and we've got, but, that, but again, I have a theory of movement building this, the parable of the sower. You have to see lots planting lots of seeds, and that's what we've been doing quietly um, for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and, you know, the birds are going to eat up some, the sun's going to, you know, burn up some, the people are going to step on some, but you've got to have enough, and we've got a whole new group of seeds that are beginning to blossom, and they're in freedom schools, they are new mayors of cities, but we've got to make sure that people understand that when you get power, it's not just about you that there's an obligation to pull those who are left behind. And I'm convinced I'm as optimistic because I don't know what we're gonna do, because I don't, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna end poverty and we work very closely with Reverend Barber, but the first place is to end child poverty and to break the cycle of poverty. And it's gonna save us money. Bob Solo at MIT did a study for us in 2008 and said we can't afford to keep these children poor, 14 million then. It costs half trillion dollars in dropout costs, you know, and prison costs. It's a bargain to stop child poverty. And we're laying out an updated report from the Urban Institute very shortly that says here's what it costs to do something about child poverty. We did one two years ago. For $77 billion, we could lift the floor for 62% of all of our children and 60% of all of our children and 72% of all black children. Um, and, you know, it, it, it and it, we still got all this prison cost. States are spending on average almost two times per prisoner th than for public school pupils. What a dumb investment policy. And we're going to end child poverty as the first step to end poverty for everybody in this rich nation. And we know how to pay for it, and we're going to save money. So I hope you, when you hear the call, come and vote and organize and get it done. My name is Bob Hart. I'm a docent here at the JFK. Uh, Museum. And I just want to tell you a very brief story about the far reach of Robert Kennedy. A couple of years ago, there was a man on one of my tours, and this is in the legacy room downstairs, and there's an inscription on the wall from a speech that Robert Kennedy gave at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, it says, basically, whatever you do with your life, do something for your fellow man. And it goes on and it elaborates. This man standing next to me started crying and shaking uncontrollably. And I said to him, excuse me, sir, are you okay? He said, oh, yes. He said, I was there. I was a student. And Robert Kennedy changed my life. He said, I graduated. I went to law school. I practiced law. I ran for parliament. I was elected. And just three months before he came here, he retired as head of one of the major political parties in South Africa. Oh, beautiful. It's amazing. amazing. 
this little story like that, but it just shows you right. the impact, mm. far-reaching impact of Robert Kennedy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know how to follow that. Um, <laughs> Thank you uh, for coming, and uh, thank you, Dr. Edelman, as well. Um, I first learned about your work on my work for Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, she talked about you often. Um, I have to be honest, I have very little hope uh, that Democrats will beat Donald Trump in 2020. Um, the Democratic Party seems adrift, and the hatred that he has unleashed um, is quite powerful, as you pointed out. Um, the theme is ripples of hope. And so um, 1968 was a very dark year, and I wonder what words of hope um, you might impart to young people who are working to make a difference. Well, I, uh, I actually feel so hopeful because I look around at the big social movements that are happening in the United States today, and they're all being run by, by young people. Um, Standing Rock it was a protest movement that was really run by young people. The women's, um, the women's marches were organized by two of the three women who organized them are under 30. Um, the uh, color of change is a million strong African American, primarily African American movement to address um, uh, mass incarceration and criminal justice reform. And, uh, you know, and then look at those kids at Parkland, those Parkland students. So I kind of look around and say, hey, this is pretty good. We're, you know, we're, we're a lot of people, a lot of people mobilizing in ways that have never happened before. We have, um, we have uh, 7,000 women who have run for office since Donald Trump became elected. Wow, that 7,000, that's a lot of women saying, we can't, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I think the Me Too movement gives me a lot of, of uh, hope. And I'll, I'll just say this, the thing that gives me most hope of all is, um, is the rise of NGOs, of nonprofit organizations, which has, totally revolutionized the world over the last 30 years in particular. And when I, I started working on human rights 30 years ago, 35 years ago, all of Latin America was under right-wing military dictatorships. Today there's not one left standing. And all of Eastern Europe was under communism. Today there's not one left standing. South Africa was the height of apartheid. It's now had a series of freely elected governments elected by a majority of their people and women's rights was not on the international agenda. And today, CEDAW, the Women's Rights Convention, has been ratified by 183 countries. All those changes took place, not because governments or militaries or huge multinational corporations wanted them to. Multinationals and, and, and militaries and governments tried to stop them. They all took place because small groups of determined people harnessed the dream of freedom and made it come true despite the powers they faced. And that's what's going to lead the United States back to democracy and back to freedom and back to an embrace of our God. Did you plant that guy? Uh. <laughs> that question was, uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, very quickly, thank Father. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, I'm uh, very happy to be here. I loved your father very much and uh, my relatives in East Kentucky still talk about him. they remember down in Harlem mm -hmm. <clears throat> but on a personal note I want to tell you that I'm the reason he won the Indiana primary <laughs> thank you <laughs> yes <laughs> I was a student at the University of Georgia, and I headed up uh, the Bobby Kennedy campaign at the University of Georgia, uh -huh. and I survived. <clears throat> uh, and I went from Georgia up to Indiana to work for him uh, in Indianapolis, and so I like to take some credit in his victory. <laughs> Yay, way to go. 
and uh, he's still my hero. Thank you, Father. And Ms. Harris, I want to tell you that I campaigned for your husband in New Jersey in 1976. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I had his big orange sticker on the back of my car that said Harris. So I'm very happy to meet you here today. Uh -huh. oh, but thank you very much. Beautiful. Oh, thank nice. you very much. Well, thank you all. Thank you all. What a wonderful evening. Thank you all to our three. Uh, we, we have to stop. I'm so sorry. I'm getting very bad uh, right. <laughs> signals. Thank you.